We have been married 34 years, which is, I know, that's great. That's why we who's, have a right wait, to say Who's anything. under 34? Who's under 34 here? Just out of curiosity. Okay. <laughs> who's under four okay. years? Okay. Who's under two years? Well, Lisa mentioned Cloud and Fire Ministries. That is, oh, so we're supposed to say, I'm getting no cards no, no, here. Okay. You're going to say this? Go, no, go, keep going. You're doing and well. I'm the loudmouth in our family. Um, this is a two-part talk that we're doing. So we're talking about holidays. So is it together time or a ticking time bomb? And if you are newlyweds, you, are you brand new? Have you gone through the holidays once yet? Yeah. yeah, you have. Okay. So what we've learned in our marriage is that it's, it's sometimes a ticking time bomb. And so we wanted to share some of the things that we have learned along the way. And um, next week we'll be talking more specifically about gift giving. And we're going to have some true confessions about our worst gift nightmares in our marriage. <laughs> hey, boy. It'll be fine. <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> okay, so who, who here is from out of state? Okay, anybody from outside of the United States? That's okay. Okay, so we've got, okay, so we're, Australia. Yeah, that's right, you're from Australia, you're both from Australia, right? Okay, so who else raised their hands? England. England, all right. Anybody else? So we got England, Australia. How about out of state? Somewhere out of where? Florida. Florida Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Virginia. Virginia. Uh, Can you say a few words for us, please? Yeah, okay, yeah. good job. Oh, so what we wanted to talk about is when you're wherever you're from, you don't have an accent. It's only when you move somewhere else or you're with people who are from somewhere else that they notice that you talk differently than they do. And that's the same with the, we find in marriage and the same that we find in cross-cultural ministry, which is what we do every day. And we have a cross-cultural home because we have taken in young people who live with us and who are essentially our children. And we've, they're all Mexican. And we've learned from them about cross-cultural things. And we have learned in 34 years that this is a cross-cultural experience. And what we found out is normal, like if you have a British accent or an accent from Virginia or Australia, normal is what you're used to, right? Normal is what I'm used to, whether it's in the way we speak, the way we do things, the way we celebrate the holidays, Normal is what I'm used to. So what I would like you to do right now is turn to your spouse. Some of you may not have your spouse here. But turn to your spouse, look him or her in the eyes, and say, normal is what I'm used to. Ladies first. Just say at the same time. Normal is what I'm used to. Right? Now that we have that clear, it's... it's important that we realize normal is not really what I'm used to. My experience is unique to me, but it colors everything that I do. And I wanted to give you an example from our home. Every day, right now we have a 22-year-old young man who we call our son, who is living with us, and he is from Mexico. And this is an example of the kind of things that happen in our home. Hey, can you help me put the cat under the tire? <laughs> Does anybody like have this conversation in their house? Do you, have you ever had that conversation? Would you help me put the cat under the tire? Like, what are you talking about? Like, normally you would just like start getting hysterical. What are you talking about? Why are you going to put the cat under the tire? But I, I just said, what are you trying to say to me? And he said, he starts laughing, and he says, oh, in Spanish, the jack is el gato. So it's the word for cat, who knows why, but if you translate it in English, it's, you know, it doesn't make sense in a situation. 
And we have learned in our work, in our ministry, in our home with kids, and in our marriage, that we have to check in first and say, what is normal to you? Because what you're talking about right now is not making sense in my world, but I have to understand it's normal to my spouse. And the first thing I have to do is realize what's normal to me, because back to our example of where did you come from and, you know, do you have an accent when you're at home? No, you don't. When you're at home, that's the way everybody talks. It's when you get somewhere else, and it's like that in marriage, too. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so where we're going to first start is talk a little bit about each culture has its own hidden rules, a kind of unspoken uh, uh, requirements of how you live and how you conduct yourself and how you communicate. And uh, I know for Melody and I, we both came from different backgrounds and different parts of the country. I'm originally from Michigan, and she's a California girl. I, I married a California girl because I understood you had to marry California to stay here. At least that's what somebody told me. Um, but it, it, we, we both came into the relationship with preconceived notions of what was right and what was wrong in how a relationship worked. Um, but they're never obvious. And that's one of the things we learned uh, very early on is what I'm uh, expecting on, during a holiday is very different from what she was expecting uh, for the holiday. I just want to reiterate what he said. So just, just think about it and let it sink in. Every single group, so this is, this is something that we've learned in missions and ministry, but it applies to marriage. Every group has hidden rules. Rules that are not spoken usually, but are understood by members of the group. And, and that doesn't mean just a culture, it means every family has hidden rules. You have rules about where you will be on the holiday, what you will eat on the holiday, what you will wear on the holiday, what you will drink or not drink on the holiday. Those rules are understood, but they are not normal, because normal is what I'm used to, right? But the other person isn't used to that. They don't know the hidden rules. And I think a lot of times in marriage, but, and it could be also, you know, who takes out the trash? Who gets the oil changed in the car? Those hidden rules come from our families of origin, but we've never stopped to think about, you know, where I come from, we say, yo. You, you know, it's, it's so hidden that we haven't brought it to the surface, and it brings a lot of tension sometimes in marriages, or at least it did in ours. We're going to talk about that now. So just taking a few steps back for just a moment uh, to make sure we keep this in context. When the Bible talks about the two of us becoming one flesh, that's marked by an event, a marriage ceremony. But becoming one flesh is not a single event. It's really a process. And we have to remind ourselves of that because uh, it's just not an automatic boom. You're both going to be thinking uh, alike. You're both going to be making the same assumptions. That's not, I mean, it, it seems like it's obvious, but it's something that sometimes you have to take a step back and restate and remind yourself, this is a process that we're going to have to go through and work through. And I think sometimes the journey is more important than the destination. And this is one of those cases where that's true. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some holiday expectations. Okay. So um, what we wanted, we, we were looking back, and the reason we brought this topic up is because it was so loaded for us. And I would say, I mean, the sad, I'm going to tell you, the really sad part of the story is when all of the holiday stress, not all, but 90% of the holiday stress went away was when parents died. 
because parents have expectations on us. And my parents have expectations on me, and his parents have expectations on him, and they're different. And so we're trying to please each other, and we're trying to please our parents. So if we had it to do all over, we would go back and learn things sooner so that we didn't have to say, oh, wow, now we don't have to deal with that stress after a death. I mean, that's, that's a really sad thing. But Pride's going to talk about what holidays, so we're kind of lumping. And, you know, I think there's all different holidays. We could, we could do a whole session on Valentine's Day, right? But we're sort of lumping Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year into this. And he's going to talk about what it was like in his home. And then I'm going to talk about what it was like in my home. Before I actually go there, though, um, I would say that if you start from the basis of your relationship is healthy and that you're both coming from a healthy background, that's one thing. But uh, that, I guess we have to redefine normal because so many of us come from family backgrounds that aren't necessarily uh, healthy or 100% healthy. And, um, and, and I know in our relationship, we, part of the difference in our backgrounds definitely affected the lens through which we looked at the holidays through. Um, and each of you are, are going to have a different lens on how you look at the ho holiday, which changes your expectations. So in, in my family, the holiday season was uh, magical. It really was. Because we set aside all our cares and concerns and focused on the family and enjoying each other um, surprising each other with presents, uh, it was it was meant to be a magical magical experience for uh, for us kids, and our parents and our grandparents were very good about doing that. So, going to the grandparents on both sides of the family, which were relatively close together where we lived in Michigan, um, was and highly anticipated. For us kids, we couldn't hardly wait to get to our grandparents' place because besides all the decorations, what was going to be under the tree? And for me, uh, what was going to be on the dinner table when we finally had dinner? I, I loved the, the Christmas food or the holiday food. Um, so that was what my holiday was really looking like, and that's the lens that I had and my expectations. I wasn't going to be able to, I didn't want to be able to anticipate what I was going to get as a present. I wanted it to be a surprise. And that's the way my family uh, couched the holidays was that was part of the mystery, part of the magic that we were going to have and experience as kids. So as, as Pride's reflected to me what the holidays were like too, he, it was always with extended family, grandparents, cousins, and just... You know, everybody gets together somewhere, and it was days. People would take days off and spend the time together. Well, in my home, my parents got a divorce when I was in early junior high, but before that, they had a horrible relationship. They basically hated each other. They were both estranged from their own families. My mother would get together with her family sometimes, but it was always with resentment and, you know, rum thing and everything. So if we got together with her family, that was, you know, like all pretense, like try to be nice, but everybody hates each other. My dad's family, they didn't even connect. He hated his brothers, he hated his dad, you know, it was just all this stuff. So for, for me, the holidays were always miserable. They always produced guilt and anxiety. They always had duty involved. In fact, Pride was shocked to find out early on in our marriage that when we were invited to my single mother's home for Thanksgiving, he was supposed to bring his toolbox and be prepared to do a day's worth of work on her house before the Thanksgiving meal. It was like he was earning his meal. So, Or several days. Oh yeah, sometimes we would stay over. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it was it, there was always duty, and there was always this thing about 
who do I go see? Do I go see my dad? Do I go see my mother? Do I go see both? Do I let my mother know that I saw my father? It was always filled with anxiety. And what I didn't realize was that not only was I carrying a lot of debris in my own person about the holidays that then was you know, coming out towards pride, but I was, without knowing it, wanting him to fix that. I was wanting him to be the anxiety reducer for me. And I hadn't even worked through all of that anxiety, and yet somehow I wanted him, like now that we're married, everything's gonna be magical. And just think about what he said, he's from Michigan. So his family, interestingly enough, was far away. My family here in Southern California, they were close. So sort of just by geography, we saw them more. And his mother died right before we got married. So it was real easy to sort of, you know, just let them be the distant ones. And we had to constantly deal with the family that had anxiety producing stuff at the holidays. I, I should say that, uh, in all fairness to her mother, uh, I think she ended up on the losing end of the proposition because, like I already mentioned, I, one of the things I looked forward was the food. So I definitely drained the reserves after uh, working at her house. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, what, uh, what we would challenge you with uh, today and suggest is that, um, as a couple, that you be very intentional about your holidays in, in this regard. My family had certain traditions that uh, that were associated with the holidays. One of the traditions was going out and seeing the rest of the family. Uh, one of the traditions involved uh, sometimes uh, our folks waking us up at, uh, or us still being awake at 11 or 12 o'clock at night and going ahead and opening our Christmas presents at our home. That way when we got up in the morning, we'd just head out to the grandparents right off without, without any delay. So there were certain things and traditions that we had in my family uh, at that time, and, and Melody and I developed a couple of traditions in ours that gradually moved us into a different direction. Uh, before I talk about that, though, uh, I should ask, in your relationships, is there, have you had an opportunity to uh, run into this wall of where you're family traditions, respective family traditions, have collided. Yeah? I can see some of the, the emotional scars right about now. One. <laughs> he, for instance, he just talked about they would always open a present at night time. And, you know, I know some, some families open presents, especially Hispanic families, open every present the night before, you know, on Christmas Eve. And some open at Christmas morning. So I am a Christmas morning person, plus the fact that there was so much tension and so much letdown and so much just junk that I always wanted to have a present at the end of everything so that, you know, it was like something to look forward to. And so pride every single year, like several days before Christmas and like all Christmas Eve day, I'll go, do you want to open a present? Do you want to open a present? Sit down, I want to give you a present. And and he used to make me open presents. And then there was like no presents under the tree. And it you know, it sounds like such a little sad thing, like nothing. But it was it was a big deal to me because I needed something to look forward to. So so little tiny things, like you said, you can collide into them. It's like a brick wall. And as I mentioned, part of my family tradition was to make sure that you gave a present that was going to surprise that person. And so I found out early on that didn't work. With but he Melody. has definitely surprised me. I you know, definitely surprised her with certain presents. But that wasn't, that wasn't directed at what she was hoping for. And what I was being obtuse to was giving a gift that was... Uh, suitable to her expectations, more in line with that. 
Uh, not yes. necess- and it wasn't uh, to be a salve or a bomb or something like that. It mm-hmm. was to demonstrate that I knew her well enough to know what kind of gift she was hoping for. And that was a real, a real sticking point for the two of us and because I was holding the position, it should be a surprise. This should be a total surprise for you. Because what's normal, what's normal is what yeah. I'm used right. to. Right. Right. So we would love to tell you that we caught on early, but the reason that we're here, the reason we wanted to talk about this, I, I would say it took us 20, 30, no, 20. 20 24 years, maybe, to, to get it right. So, so there's been a lot of stuff that didn't work. So now back to, I said we work in cross-cultural ministry. We have a cross-cultural home. And one of the theories about cross-cultural ministry is that you don't totally lean in the direction of one culture or the other. We work with Latinos. So we don't, we don't just like forget our culture and do everything Latino way. And, and we don't ask them to forget everything about them and do everything our Anglo way. But the best way is when you take the best components of both and mix them together and you actually end up with almost a third culture. So that's what we do in ministry is we teach some things and we learn some things and I think that's what works in marriages and what we found is that when we finally, like I said, 99% of the stress was released after parents died. But earlier than that, we started to get to the place where we realized we are going to have some things that are our tradition that are separate from his family, separate from my family, separate from our past, that are new, that are things we develop, that we want our children to experience, that we want, we want to look forward to. We want to say, hey, did you do the, you know, did you get the lights out or whatever it is? Did you get the tickets to the musical or whatever we decide we're going to do? Did you buy that special coffee? Do you have the ingredients for that special breakfast that we're going to have that we know how that always goes. So that's part of uh, part of the process of becoming one is developing those family traditions that are uni- unique to you as a couple. That's going to be different from each of your respective families. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't adopt certain traditions that uh, that come from your family. I'm just saying There needs to be something that's unique for you two as a couple, for your children, uh, your nephews, or or whoever you have as a part of that celebration. You need to come up with things that are are definitely unique to you. And so for Melody and I, one of the things that uh, we we did for years and years is we were involved with a church that always had uh, Christmas services that would do seven services Christmas Eve. And so we'd be coming home late at night on Christmas Eve, which made opening a present really difficult sometimes, uh, Christmas Eve. But nonetheless, that became part of our our family tradition. And and that's what what we're going to encourage you guys to do and, and come up with. Yeah, so we were on staff at a church, at a big mega church, and we had to work those services. And then we also had to work Thanksgiving morning because there was always a Thanksgiving morning service. So we got to then say to our families, we'll come over, but it's not going to be the all-day thing. We're doing our thing in the morning, and you know, then you can come to our place. Or We changed it up. And, you know, of course, everybody knows about uh, if family members are alive and in close proximity and all of that, alternating when you go and working that out. And now as parents, we can see how difficult that is and how the parents want their kids. You know, they want you there because something feels empty to them. But it might be that if you set your own tradition and start doing your own thing, they might be able to flex and do things a different way too. 
So we actually have some homework for you. We're going to pass that out. Then we're going to take questions, and I know you guys are, are wanting to get out of here and, and have announcements. But um, what we've asked for you to do, and we have gone to some really great marriage conferences that have, have blessed us by just forcing us to, to think through and talk through these issues. So what we think would be good is just bring it to top of mind. Talk it through and, and, and know, you know, just like we can't always identify what's in a culture or, or what's in a geographical area until we get somewhere else. Identify what you have each done. So three things that are from each of your family of origin that talk about the traditions you celebrate and, and the ones that you hold dear. Because some there are some traditions that we all have in our families that we hate. And we keep doing them, but we hate them, we don't want to do them. But there are some that, you know, Thanksgiving means this, or it's not Christmas without, or on New Year's we have to do this. It, Put those out there and talk about those with one another. And then maybe two things, maybe more, things that you could explore that are totally out of the box. Maybe what, what you would love to do is go to Bermuda for the holidays or you know, do something crazy, climb a mountain or go camping or you know, things maybe you've never even voiced not for yourself, let alone with one another. So um, whether you do that and have that conversation during the week, or if you want to do a little bit of it now, it's fine. But I think we're just going to take questions and answers and then let Lisa and Kyle come back up. Yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, I, I was a little less delicate about that, um, just simply because, because of the way I was raised. And, and so I, early on with my, my extended family, I let them know up front that, uh, you know, I, I'm out on the California coast, and Yes, I'll, I'm willing to come back there at certain times, but that needs to be reciprocated if that's the case, and, and not to always expect me. Um, and uh, that was the healthy thing to do at that point. It was a little different with Melody's family. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's pushback all the way. And what we have learned in in our family, and so, you know, like if we're going up in age or down in age, you know, to younger, we, we just have open conversations, and I think those are hard, but as long as you can just validate the relationship, because if family, if family wants you there, it's because it, they fear it means you don't love me anymore, you know, and so I think they just need to hear, uh, we love you, and you know, we're going to miss it, but we, I mean, it's really hard even financially or when kids come along, it's hard to travel. And and so whatever you negotiate with them, it just have those hard conversations, but there's definitely pushback. But what, what I think we've come up with is, and, and maybe it was a little bit easier too for me, Lisa, because there were so many things about my family I wanted to leave behind. I didn't want to be in that dysfunction. So it was easier to say, you know what, it's us now, and we can't do this, but we can do this. You know, we can do a piece of what you want us to do, but we can't do all of it, and it's because we're, we're doing our own life. And I think that there, there's sometimes some hurt with that, but you can, you can mitigate it with those open conversations. And just to restate, one important aspect of that is, the assumption is, is that you as a couple are having that conversation about what's healthy and what isn't healthy. Uh, what what traditions does your family have as far as expectations on you that come from debris? And, and you two as a couple have to be on the same page of what that is. Um, so it's, you know, I, I'm sure that 
any number of you get the kind of pressure from their, your family that, look, it's expected that you're here. And that's pretty tough when you have two different families pulling you in both directions in that regard. So you two, as a couple, have to be on the same page, so you provide a united, united front in dealing with your parents, just like you're going to be providing a united front, front if you have children. It's the same dynamic there. Yeah. Any other questions? Cheryl. Sure. Getting a list from Melody of what she wants from Chris. For this yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I. So no more surprises. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, no, that's not true. I, I do that also. If he goes by the list, that's a surprise. So that counts. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have, you'll actually get a little bit more of that story next week. I think one of the things that we've done, and, and this has been interesting, Christmas always has everybody pulling, you know, even we, we have all these like adopted kids that don't really belong to us, and so they've got other families pulling on them. So for us, Thanksgiving is the big deal. We make Thanksgiving huge, and we invite everybody, and we make it an all-day thing. And somewhere, I, I think actually Saul and Sarah are with us, and I think it was... Saul's fault. One Thanksgiving, we went to the movies on Thanksgiving after the meal. We eat our meal early so people can go elsewhere. And we went to the movies, like a 4.30 movie, and realized no one is there. And now we love to do that. So, you know, just little things like that. We don't usually take big trips. We usually stay home and are more quiet now that we're in ministry. We just need time, soft time. Yeah. We can't move from all the eating. Okay. <laughs>